Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremiah Johnson, the chair of the Young Nurturers Committee. Welcome to the Young Nurturers InRef webinar series. Today, uh, the topic is uh, a hot on the trail, a field guide to the nurse surgery residency match process. Um, we are have a great speaker and panel with the idea being to go over the basics of how the nurse surgery process for matching works. Um, and I will go ahead and give a brief preamble and then we'll get to our speaker and then our panelists and then questions and answers. So please um, put any questions you may have during the talk to the question and answer session and we'll have a period at the end of the webinar to discuss those questions um, with you. Um, so uh, the goal of this webinar series is to provide students, residents, and young nurse surgeons with timely information, education, and inspiration towards a career in nurse surgery. So this is right in the wheelhouse of our webinar today's topic. Um, young surgeons, what are they? They're a committee of the AANS. Um, we develop future leaders of nurse surgery and provide a channel for young nurse surgeons to impact the direction of our subspecialty. Um, what is the AANS, you may ask? It's uh, American Association of Neurological Surgeons. It's a scientific and educational association with more than 10,000 members worldwide. Um, it does many, many things, uh, but it's in, in short, is an organization that guides the field of nurse hey, surgery. What's up? And uh, its roles include education, advocacy, and promoting highest quality patient care. What is the NREF then, if this is the Young Nurses and NREF webinar? It's the Nurse Surgery Research and Education Foundation, uh, which is a 501c3 not for profit organization created and founded by the Association of Neurological Surgeons. Uh, it more or less it funds educational uh, content and research uh, for nurse surgery. Um, it supports basic science, clinical research, as well as lifelong education to foster improved outcomes for patients with neurosurgical diseases. And then one of the many things they do is sponsor many resident cor educational courses um, in person, um, as well as like this one virtual. So we really appreciate their support. Uh, I see someone raise their hand. It's going to be hard for me to manage raising hands um, in this particular talk. Um, so please write a question and answer. Uh, if possible, and we'll try to answer that on the side um, bar with some of our, ten, our um, panelists can help us with that. Um, next week, we're going to have a really exciting webinar as well, slightly different. It's going to focus on the pathways to become a neurosurgeon clinician scientist. Many people that want to go into neurosurgery not only want to help patients, but want to contribute to advancing the field and certainly become a clinician scientist. Neurosurgeon is one of the prominent ways to do that. So we're going to get some thoughts from Dr. Liao and Dr. Barker on some of the pathways to, uh, to help advance our field in that manner next week. Uh, ooh, this is a little blurry, so I apologize about that. Um, but we wanted to welcome our young nurse surgeons panelists. We have a really distinguished panelist group this week. Um, Dr. Carolyn Quincy is the assistant professor in pediatric neurosurgery. Um, she's an associate program director and research director for neurosurgery at UNC Medical Center. Uh, welcome Dr. Quincy, it's great to have you here. Um, several other members of our Nursing Neurosurgeons Committee uh, are here today at various experience levels. Um, and um, Aurora Cruz, uh, who's uh, an MBA and MD, neurosurgery resident at the University of Louisville, Louisville, is planning to go into supervascular surgery. Welcome, Aurora. Um, Jasmine Tum Desare, I believe. She's going to have to correct me. I always struggle with her name, so my apologies, Jasmine. Um, neurosurgery resident at UCLA um, has been a real powerhouse in advocating for um, getting information to medical students during, uh, particularly during these difficult times with virtual interviews um, and, and limited sub-bias. So thank you, Jasmine, for coming. Saqib Huck, who is our uh, mission fellow, one of our committee members, is a medical student, MD candidate class of 2021 at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he is recently matched, so congratulations, Saqib, and thanks for joining us. And then finally, uh, we have Samantha Lyons, who's an MD candidate for the class of 2023, has not yet gone through the match process, and so we can get her thoughts and questions as we go through all of this. Thank you all for joining us. Let's see if my slides will go right through. Um, I did not actually put on two well-known people to our committee who will also be speaking, so I'll go ahead and introduce them. Christopher Greg Feo, who's a, currently a chief resident and infolded um, skull base fellow at Mayo Clinic Rochester. He's joining us uh, here and will giving his thoughts on this process as well. He's written um, articles about this uh, in journals and you can find his writings which are outstanding on this topic, um, which is one of the reasons we invited him here. So thank you for Chris. And uh, also, 
Uh, let's see if I can bring him up here. Jo Joseph Lindsay, who uh, is at University of Michigan. I don't have his slides here, but I believe he's a PGY3 now. He's also on our committee who uh, similarly has a very recent experience and has written about this topic as well. And so thank you, Joy, for coming. Finally, our featured guest, Dr. Jamie Von Gumpel, who is a professor of neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic Rochester. He's the residency program director there, as well as the vice chair for education. I'd like to put um, our guests' training pathway up for the students to kind of get an idea of how people progress through neurosurgery. And we really wanna thank uh, Dr. Van Gompel for joining us today. And uh, with that, I will turn my slide, the slides over to him to give a bit of a preamble to what we're gonna to discuss today, which is the match process for neurosurgery. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. And um, thank you to the NREF, um, as well as the Young Neurosurgeons Committee to give me the opportunity to talk about something that probably all of us are experts on. Um, and it's weird to say I'm probably one of the more gray haired persons on the panel on the other end of the, of just leaving the program director role at the Mayo Clinic. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to give you some thoughts. I'm sure this will be a lively discussion at the end. Um, uh, and I wanted to, again, thank Dr. Graffio and Dr. Johnson for the opportunity to talk. And they charged me with uh, effectively telling you what I would do if I was going through the match this next year and uh, years after, which I think we'll try to bring that together in concepts that everyone can utilize. Um, so if I, if I were to be an MS3 student in match this year, um, what would I have done prior to my MS3 year? Because I see there's a couple of people that have joined us that are there from, uh, you know, MS2 to MS1. And I think, you know, the, the idea of developing relationships and mentorship is more and more critical the further you get along, but it, it can't start too early. I know uh, Dr. Graffio has done a really good job at our institution of developing multiple mentors early on in his career, and he still utilizes people he learned in medical school and before that to his asset later on in life. So I would just say, Get involved with the neurosurgery department the best you can. That doesn't mean be there all the time, but be around, be known, show you are interested. And if you haven't, today is the right day to reach out to your program director or your local friendly neurosurgeon and get to know them. Try to get on some publications, obviously, before your MS3 year. That does, that's not a mandatory. It is something that we utilize to try to distinguish between the 300 plus applicants every year. And the publications do not have to be in neurosurgery. There's a lot of, you know, funny herbal, you know, how this herb treats, you know, hypertension and so forth in the publications that we see. That's okay. We want to see that you're learning the process of writing. And um, very critical, I think, that people under-recognize and how much the program directors very much value is that your grades across your clinical rotation, so your PGY or your uh, MS3 year, are super helpful to us to understand if you're someone that can get along in different groups. And it's very good, not that you need perfect straight A's, and as you know, some of the schools don't even grade these rotations, but we spend, the program directors themselves spend a lot of time looking at these. So it's very, it's very much to your benefit to try to score or do well during those times. The board scores I put a question mark by, because some people on here aren't gonna have to worry about at least step one scores, and we're gonna show some data Later on, at least in neurosurgery, what, uh, what good board scores actually are, not necessarily to our institution. But the traditional cut, cutoff line out there has been 230 and above that some, I would say, uh, lazier institutions use to try to screen medical students. And um, some even go higher, like to 240. As, as you know, when they go away, there's a lot of talk. And, and, and after this, there's an SNS talk about this. I think most programs are actually just going to plan on using the step two score, which may put more pressure on it. So what might be a blessing may be actually uh, uh, more of a curse to be quite honest with you and put more pressure. So just so you're all aware of that, if you're younger listening to this, this is the target scores for the 2020 match in neurosurgery. And what this shows is the variance in, in numbers in which institutions use for scores below which they generally did not grant interviews. And that number hovered somewhere around 225 to 230. Um, 
and scores above which programs almost always granted interviews was very variable, but it seemed to still cluster just a little bit above 235. And um, obviously there was no upper end that got everybody interviews, but the, um, the interesting thing is the steps two scores cluster the same way. And that's the rationale for people thinking about using step two. Uh, for screening uh, going forth. Now, some institutions such as ours are thinking differently and are probably not going to use these anymore to screen. Um, I think this is the most critical slide for those matching this year, and I want this to be to come across really clear. Uh, most of the programs, so over 85% of the programs are using VLS, VSLO. Um, the rules that the SNS are going to set forth is that if you have a singular home institution, they're expecting that you rotate between four to eight weeks at that institution and obtain letters from there. It looks like the general surgery letter that they utilized last year is probably not going to be part of the match process this year. It's probably going to be neurosurgeons. So for those of you looking to a good general surgeon to help you out like they did last year, you're probably not going to need that. But this is the most critical thing is that you're gonna get one rotation away from your institution. And I think you're gonna to need to choose quite wisely. The VSLO for the, for the three month block that this will start. So August and September will be targeted during this time actually opens on April 15th. And a lot of us will be filling maybe two to four slots per month. So I would be on top of this, have your application done by the 15th and submitted because they're released to the institutions, I think on the 21st. So think about that because you're gonna get one shot at an institution. And I think it's a little bit like they've been talking about these tokens and who, you know, to wink at a program or tell them that you really like them. I think that the programs that you rotate are gonna take, take you very seriously. So you're gonna to have to think a lot about that this year. Um, and just so you know, so for instance, our institution is going to have four slots in August, four slots in September, and four slots in October. Some people will probably rotate past then into November and December. And I would target a program that either be respected in your future market of practice. So if you plan to, you know, work on the East Coast, you know, uh, ranking places like Hopkins and Duke and, and uh, MGH are very helpful because it's got a very good brand recognition, right? Um, but on the West Coast, they may not have as high of a brand recognition. So it's something you want to think about. And I think if you know that you want to get moving closer to home and you've been away from your family for, for a while, I would very uh, strongly consider rotating at that program that you think you want to be at that's closest to your family, because that's going to be your best op opportunity to match. And I think in the, in the past, uh, so after this, so this is less of a timely discussion, I think we usually rotated told people to rotate at a variance of programs, meaning a larger program and a smaller program just to get a different feel for programs. I still think that's a valid thing. Up until last, last year, a lot of people were doing two or three away rotations. Um, and I think that was actually becoming quite normal at that time. I don't think we'll get back to that, by the way. So letters of reference, who do I ask? And I think you'll get a, a lot of different opinions on this. But I think your first letter needs to come from someone that you know is going to advocate for you, that knows you well, that's going to spend the time to make a nice letter and put the correct language in that letter. So they need to know how to write those letters that, that is going to signal to other program directors that I really like this person. Letter two needs to come, I think, from someone from stature at your institution. That can be the chair, the vice chair, the program director, or someone in the field that you're really interested in that you would really respect. But I think those two letters uh, should be from your home institution. And then your third letter, uh, there's two ways to go at this. It could be that same person of stature at your rotating institution, granted that they probably won't know you very well. But um, when I rotated at my way rotations, I generally tried to pick people that were that knew me very well. And I think that did service me well, but I think you can go either way with the letters of recommendation. I think that'll be a good point of discussion later on for our panel. So when you're on your home and away rotations, you need to remember to try to show that you're a team member and that you can be part of a team. You need to get to know the residents because they're probably your best advocates and cheerleaders for the day of the rank list. What happens is their discussions about you percolate up to the staff level. And it's probably one of the most key ways that we pick residents is how residents think about other resident applicants. 
Uh, Pre-round, present to your junior. It's very easy nowadays to be lazy and not do that. You want to know what's going on in the service. Look for opportunities to share your knowledge. Don't necessarily just go home at the end of the, of the day when your service is done or your resident says so. If there's cases still going on in the operating room, you know, this is only a month, two months or three months. We expect you to be hustling, trying to learn as much, you know, tying, helping close wounds, that kind of stuff. But if you're told to be home or the, or the, or the resident needs some room, please respect them. And, and otherwise it becomes socially awkward when you try to stick around when they tell you to go home. And I think uh, I'm sure some of the most recent medical students can talk, can speak to that. You know, in the application, so what really matters is this, is that once you hit a threshold and you get looked at at an institution, it really shifts in what we actually are interested in. We want to know what your plan is. We want to see that you have enthusiasm because what we want is when we come to work every day, we want to be around someone who's excited to be there every day. And um, that's a very easy thing to see on interviews. If you're falling asleep on interviews, that obviously that's not going to portray well into your final mat, match position. And we want to see you connect with people, right? And that gets all the way down to the EPCs or the people that are helping us with uh, the organization of the match process. We want to see you to be nice to everybody, be professional. But at all points in time, you have to demonstrate professionalism, enthusiasm, and competence. And that's probably all that really matters in the match process. When you have interviews, I think it's really critical to have a plan. So rather than just thinking about being reactionary to the questions we're going to ask, I think you have to understand and what you think you're going to do for neurosurgery in a long-term plan. And you need to convey that on your interview. And when you're doing, uh, when you attend your interview, I think they'll also they want to know what are you going to do for us over the next seven years? Are you going to come to all the visiting professors? Are you going to be fun to hang out with? Are you going to also expand the name and, and footprint of this institution, right? So this is your chance to sell your dream. And I think it's a great opportunity to do that. I know last year virtually really didn't affect that very much compared to in-person interviews. What we lost with in-person interviews was the ability to see people's actual social skills. And I think that uh, we'll have to see how that works out yet. That's kind of an experiment. So you still need to, through this whole process, find some friends and mentors that are advocates for you and, and lay heavily on them and utilize them to match. Spend the time, all the time that you have to continue to learn about neurosurgery. When you get pimped in the operating room, no one really cares if you know the answer. They just want to see you have an intelligent um, idea of what's going on. And if you don't know, they want you to say, well, I'm going to find out tomorrow, right? No one, you could, I, I think when I was rotating away, I must've missed a hundred of questions when I was being pimped. It's okay. Nobody cares, but they do want to see how you react to it, right? And above all, stay professional, enthusiastic. Never take the opportunity to tank another co-applicant uh, or resident, even if offered by somebody or they say, I don't really like them. I think as an applicant, you really want to avoid those situations and take the high road. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview of our match process at Mayo, what it was before the, uh, the pandemic and what we did last year and probably what we'll be doing for so as I said, you know, we, we get about 350 applications and then we get down to about 200 applicants with cutoffs. And I gotta say, after our experience this year, and this is one of the several benefits from COVID-19, we found that we do need to expand our, our, our who we're looking at because we found a lot of really good candidates that, that didn't miss, uh, meet those traditional criteria. We interviewed typically between 50 and 60 people of those 20 to 25 were rotators and we'd interview about 10 to 12 people per uh, interview and had three of them. We had a PGY5 interview panel that's, that saw everybody as well as the education committee at our institution that's six physicians that would interview everybody. So there was about seven interviews. And after each interview, each one of those groups would offer a score and we would total those scores. That would give us the top 20 applicants. And then we would produce a Heisman type ranking, put that together and then sit down and talk about them openly. And that would be our final list after our rank night discussion and some final you know, clarification after our rank night discussion. Then we submitted our list. In last year, what we did was some other things. We looked at all 350 applications um, top to bottom. We 
offered about 100 interviews overall. Uh, what we did was we asked people to offer a sub, um, a uh, optional five minute video or audio of a standardized interview, which was actually quite um, telling of, the, of them. And we really learned a lot about how people manage that. Then we had an interview panel, but what we did do is that we had a bunch more people uh, not see everybody. So we had maybe half of the people interview half of the, of the, of the group. We um, also offered, uh, sorry, if you can hear that, my cats are fighting in the background. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we also offered to people that had reached out before rotations uh, a virtual uh, uh, interview and rotations with us, which was actually super fun. And I think we learned and got to know people pretty well. And we went through a similar process, but what we found was that we had to meet more expansile with our list. And it was actually really interesting how, uh, what we learned this year. And I think it's gonna help us prepare to how we're gonna deal with when we don't have USMLE scores. But I think what it comes down to is you have to create entropy in the, in the uh, match. And if those of you who don't want to think about physics, what entropy is, is attempts to measure the randomness or chaos in a system. And typically, you know, this is used in thermodynamics. But I would just say that the, the neurosurgical match is a very high entropy or random situation. And that COVID-19 and also going forth with all the changes in interviews, that now there's even more randomness. And I think the charge for you is to somehow take advantage of this randomness to increase your positive interactions with persons that you think you re that respect you and that will think highly of you on that list. And I think it's very clear that you can do that in a way that will take advantage of the entropy of the match process. I do think there's some very key points when you go through this process. It's very easy to lose yourself and try to be someone that you're not. I think you're gonna be very unhappy if you do that. I think it's very important that um, if you, you know, have a question that you reach out if you're that kind of person. And if you're not that kind of person, then don't reach out. I think you should be true to yourself. If you wanna to go to a community and this applied last year to COVID, but I think if you wanna do a second look and even if the institution is telling you not to, you can still go to that community and look around and see how it fits you. Do what you would do normally. And I think that's gonna serve you very well. I said this before, I'll say it again. I think trash talking anybody at any time during the match process is a really bad idea. That stuff spreads like wildfire and I would avoid that um, as much as you can. I think it's really important to understand that time is your most valuable asset and programs know when you're reaching out to the residents to figure out what's, you know, what's their program like. If you invest some time outside of the right typical interview process, we take note of that. If you invest the time to call us and say, I want to clarify a thing, we take note of that. It's really helpful for us to know who's really interested in our program. Um, so how many interviews should you do in normal times? I think people were doing between 12 and 15. Of course, there were people doing more or so. Last year without travel um, restriction, people were doing about 20. It's very probable that this year we're gonna be having a, ma a, a mixed match system with some virtuals and then some secondary looks. I think that's what the SNS is gonna allow. So I would encourage you if the first rounds are virtual, you'll probably, you probably should think about doing around 20 this year. If they're in person, you should probably think about doing between 12 and 15. I think those are good numbers. Special circumstances are if you're a foreign medical graduate, there are no guarantees in that game. I think you should take, you should do as much as you can to try to match and you should reach out to all programs and see them. Couples is the same way. It's very difficult to match in couples and, it, and to even if you hit it off with a program, sometimes the other person doesn't. I think you're gonna have to work a little bit harder in most circumstances to match and, and spend more time uh, going out and doing more interviews. Um, something people think about a little bit, but uh, I think get caught up in the end is about thank yous. Um, we had a lively discussion, myself and Lola Chambliss from Vanderbilt about this. She thought that nobody should give a thank yous. I, I do think you should send out thank yous. I think um, if you want to match to that group, I think you should send thank yous to most of the people that you met with and say why you like that institution and you know try to keep in touch with them. It's just another opportunity to have an, uh, um, an interaction with them, whether that's through a text or an email. Um, you know, formal written thank yous are going away. Those are still nice too. Um, if you if you're not thinking about that program, don't Matt, don't don't bother sending thank yous. I don't think it's worth your time. Your time is very limited. And as I said, I think emails and text are fine. I don't think it has to be formal. 
Um, and if you don't have the context, the EPCs will give you the context to get to those people. Uh, one final plug for the residents. The residents are what make the balloons float to the top. They, if they like somebody, they're going to push that person up onto the staff. They're going to talk about them all the time. Uh, their opinion about fit is very critical. So I can't un uh, underestimate how important the residents are to the match process. And I would, I think if you're disregarding uh, spending time with them, I think you're really missing out because they're probably the ones that run the match process, at least at our institution, more than most places. Um, and second looks, I, you know, in the past, we used to uh, obligatorily um, uh, say you don't need to do these. As I told you before, I think if you think it's going to help you, you should do it. If you have a significant other that wants to see the city before they live there, you should do it. It, it isn't, uh, I will tell, they, tell you, they have been successful at our institution in the past. I think they can be utilized, um, but it's, it's really a, a personal decision. Um, and how do you communicate your interests later on in the season? I think you should let the programs know that you like them. Um, let the residents know that you like them. And emailing is just fine. Calling, um, additional phone calls are fine. But I think this really helps people know that when you're keeping contact that you're interested. A word about rate number one rankings. No program should ever ask you to tell you that they're ranking number one. That is a match violation and they should not put you in that situation. So I think that's a malignant red flag if they're doing that anyway. Um, I don't think you should necessarily tell you, you shouldn't feel obliged to tell a program that you are ranking them number one. Even in this context, I will say that a lot of residents, uh, applicants feel obligated to do that. And I do think it may help them a little bit, but it probably doesn't ultimately um, um, alter their final match position very much. Um, and I think it's perfectly fine to tell several programs that you like them. Uh, you don't have to tell them you're number one, but I don't. I would not tell more than one program that you're that they're number one because that be, sometimes becomes obvious later on. Um, I think another really critical thing is if you're at your home institution and you you like them, but you don't really plan on staying there, and you're going to rank several places ahead of them. I would be very honest with the people that are advising you there about that. They want to see you match well. They want to help you, so it's not going to hurt their feelings. But I would take advantage of them making one call for you. Um, and I think these are very powerful tools. So if you're at the Mayo Clinic and you're thinking about going to UVA, I'll call up John Jane Jr. and say, you know what? Um, John Smith is really interested in coming to your institution. He's a great guy. I think you should really think about him. These things really make a difference. And uh, these, personal, these personal reach out means that we you know we really think that this person is is going to excel, and um, I think it's another way to increase those random interactions as well, and, and also build relationships. So think about that when you're in your you're thinking about your match process. Just a little bit of data before before we get on to the uh, further discussions, but this is from the 2020 NRMP uh, Program Director Survey, and this was the top 10 factors that we used that program directors use for interviewing and ranking. And I, I think that you look on here and you, you'll notice two things that the USMLE scores plays a really high role and that everybody's scrambling now uh, in the next couple of years. They're still going to use them, of course, but everybody, I think, is trying to diverge away from this. So th keep that in mind. The letter of recommendations are extremely critical. So I think you really need to think about developing those mentorship relationships and who's going to write those letters for you. And if you have any sense that they're not going to write a good letter for you, don't just ask someone on obligation. Go find someone that's going to write you a good letter because three good letters from random people will be will trump three mediocre letters from three hugely powerful chairs across the country. And I've, and I've seen that time and again. I also want to make a point that the personal statements, people think these make a huge difference. Don't spend too much time on these. We want to see what your plan and your future and why you're so interested in neurosurgery. But I will tell you that we'll ask you the same questions on interview. So don't worry about them too much. It is really uncommon that we see someone uh, smash a, a, a personal statement out of the park. When we get to ranking, as I said, we kind of throw everything out. It doesn't matter what your USMLE score is on ranking. Um, we look at interpersonal skills, letter of recommendation from specialties. So if you look at that, how it's in the top three in both, that's a really critical thing. And then the feedback from the residents. So I wasn't just uh, making that up. I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, a couple of other things that you might find interesting. So about two, this is the mean number of applications for each program received. It, you can't see the top of this, at least on my screen. It's about 285. 
Of that, the mean number of interviews uh, invitations sent is 46. The mean number of applicants interviewed is 34, and the mean number ranked is about 30. What you'll notice over here is that there are programs, and we do this as well, we send more interview slots than are available. Um, and that works to our favor in some aspect because otherwise everybody wants one day. It allows people to pick different, day, different days. Uh, but programs do do that. So you might get an interview and not actually be able to sit with that program. Um, and then one other thing is the interviews mostly get sent out in, in uh, October. So, and then early November and interviews are conducted mostly in November and December, at least in the last 2019-20 uh, period. Um, in the end, you know, I'm jealous and envious of anybody who's an MS4 that's going to go through this process because it was one of the most fun, fantastic years of my life. I, I remember meeting so many cool people that were just like me, and I got to go around and meet a bunch of people that would later become idols of mine. And it was the only time I've ever really had as much face time with so many important people in my mind. So I really enjoyed the process and had a lot of fun with it. And remember that it's, uh, it's critical that your career starts now. And uh, those relationships that you make now are the ones that are going to be visiting professors in the future. They're going to be friends that you hang out at meetings. They're the ones that are going to be asking you to come out to talks. And, uh, and, and you, and you want to make sure that you're leaving a good impression with everyone. And just as a final word, there's so many spots. Just relax. You know, most of the medical students, or at least from the U.S., match uh, with adequate applications. Um, so just have fun with the whole process. And that's pretty much all I had to say. Uh, thank you so much. That was really a spectacular overview, truly. Uh, nailed, nailed it, I think. So um, I want to make myself to be a bit of a moderator and not do too much commenting, because I think we have really talented people here that have lots of great input. So um, at this point, I was going to see maybe before we get Chris and um, Joey to kind of give the resident perspective on some of the do's and don'ts and how to make your way through this process. Um, just see, Carolyn, if you had any thoughts uh, based on Jamie's presentation, you want to toss in there, given your experience at a slightly different institution. I thought that was a really great overview and really good points. Um, the only things that I would add is I think that the most important part of your application is your hobby section. I think that... Um, you know, you won't, you won't be given an interview if we don't think that you're impressive. And so you might think that you need to be impressive, but actually you need to be relatable and interesting and somebody that I want to spend a lot of hours for seven years with. So um, I think really investing in that. And, um, and then when you do your interviews too, um, thinking about making sure that your questions aren't generic, you know, you're going to ask probably if you have a set of questions are the same set as the next person. And so the questions should be really specific to the person that you're interviewing with. That's great advice. Um, I think we'll go to Chris from the chief residence perspective and talk a little bit about his thoughts on uh, a little bit more granular ways that people who are, uh, you know, going through the sub process and eventually their interview process can kind of um, make themselves stand out or at least not submarine their chances. I, I know we've had many discussions about this, Chris. I'd be, uh, I'd be interested to hear kind of some of your, some of your thoughts on this matter. Yeah, of course. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Chris Graffio. I'm one of the uh, sevens here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where I've had the privilege of working with and learning from Dr. Van Gompel for the past several years. And uh, he's my, one of my fellowship directors now. So it's nice to get to share this uh, webinar with him. Um, a lot of what I say echoes, or I'm going to say, is going to echo what he had to say. <clears throat> You know, with one or two sort of personal spins or divergent points or just things that I think, um, you know, a little bit more detail might be helpful for people who are kind of running into the process right now. So um, I was asked to kind of speak mostly to the sort of before the sub -I and doing the sub -I aspect of things. Um, and I think that one of the most important things that Dr. Van Gompel mentioned that I really want to emphasize is you got to get to know your home program and <clears throat> you should start with the residents and you should start young. You know, when I was early in medical student, I made friends with the interns and those guys are now several years into practice, but it's been fun to kind of watch them grow in their career. Um, you know, they'll be around, like neurosurgery is a very small world. You hear that a million times, but like you, you want to make friends early. And those are the people who remember the most what it was like to be a medical student and who are able to understand both sort of emotionally what you're going through and can give you valuable advice. Um, 
and who also have the closest familiarity to what the system is like right now, because things have changed enough, not even just because of COVID, but even more so now that, you know, the people who are applying today are going through a different process than I went through, and I went through a different process than, than Dr. Van Gompel or Jeremiah went through. So it's, it's a thing that evolves, and you want to get the advice that is the most useful, and that oftentimes is going to come from the people who went through it the most recently. Those people can also give you good advice on um, sort of the there is, I think that as you kind of advance through this process, um, you know, there's shells within departments of understanding, you know, you kind of go peek behind sequential curtains and, you know, the the more junior residents will, uh, it'll be easier and more comfortable to ask them questions about like, you know, who's, who's uh, receptive to working with medical students, who's a good person to ask about a project, who's, um, and got a history of being a good mentor and would welcome me into their OR. And, you know, is there anyone who maybe uh, medical students have struggled to connect with in the past and wouldn't be a good person to approach first before you've sorted things out? And so getting getting a sense for the culture and the personalities can be very useful. Um, and then turning to sort of the sub I thing, you're, the residents in your home department or whatever department you have access to, if you're at an institution without a, a home department, <clears throat> and some of that can be online. It could be people like like the young neurosurgeons group, and you can reach out to people using, you know, Twitter and other online resources. But you, know, you got to connect with some trainees somewhere. Um, figuring out where to do your sub eyes is something that you need some advice from people who have insight into the the way things work. And I got some very good advice. Um, and you know, I'm glad that I did the rotations where I did. I didn't end up uh, matching to either of those programs. Um, but I got really, really valuable experience from spending the time there. And I'm glad that people pushed me to go rotate where I did. Um, the other thing that I'd say is, you know, early on, um, I would I would start writing your personal statement early. I, like I said, I agree with almost everything Dr. Van Gobble said, but I will disagree that like I love personal statements. I read all of them. I think they're interesting. I think that they're one of the things that like um, you can really stand out. Obviously, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but a lot of people dread writing them. A lot of people put it off too long. And then at the last minute, you end up just throwing together like 500 words of cliches about like pulsating brains and like your grandma's tumor and that kind of thing. And like, that's not, that's not interesting. No one wants to read that. Um, there are places that don't use them at all. There are people who don't use them at all. There are people who do. I think that if you're someone who's a comfortable writer, um, it's a good way to, to do something a little bit um, more interesting than you know just numbers on a page, publications on a page. Anyway, I'm the divergent opinion on that. I think a lot of people want to see letters go away or personal statements go away altogether. In terms of your actual sub I and how to pick where to go, um, I think you have to pick somewhere you want to match. Um, but I think you have to be realistic. Like most people, you have a better shot somewhere you rotate than somewhere you don't. Um, and, you know, I, I don't accept the argument that you shouldn't go somewhere because you're afraid that you might screw it up. Like you want to be a neurosurgeon, like you need to own that and you need to go and, and do, bring your A game and do the best you can um, and, you know, fight for a, for a spot and, and show off how awesome and interesting and hardworking you are. Um, but if you're someone who's a very borderline applicant, it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, the places that get many, many applicants, many interested rotators, et cetera, um, being a rotator there might help you out a little bit, but you're talking about m moving up the rank list in a sort of marginal part of the overall list. Whereas if you go to a bit more of an off the beaten track program, and they say like, hey, this person might be a borderline applicant, but they really like us and they want to be here. They spent a month here. They proved themselves. That might move you into like a very competitive spot at that program. And at the end of the day, every neurosurgery program is good. Like everywhere has, you know, strengths and weaknesses, but like we're very lucky as a field that it's not like some of the larger specialties where there are programs that you might get a, a less, you know, high quality education. Pretty much every neurosurgery residency will make you a good neurosurgeon if you work hard and you get the most out of it. Um, I do think it's also a good idea that if you, if you come from a place that has a very particular cultural bias, by which I mean you're somewhere that is a very clinically oriented program or a very academically oriented program, you may find it useful to pick a place that has a bit of a different culture or a bit of a different orientation for your actual, uh, your away rotation. So you can see a couple of different kinds of environments and pick what, what you want to do. Um, I wrote an article for the Young Neurosurgeons newsletter a few years ago. I'll put a link to it in the chat uh, in just a second here when I shut up. But um, I think that, that kind of covers this and a lot of other topics on this. But um, there was a couple sentences in there that I really like that I, I think that it's rather than just repeating this in a less organized fashion, I'm, I'm going to read a paragraph from this. And I, I think I'll kind of close with that, but um, sort of how to do well on a sub-I. 
Um, ideal sub high performance is nuanced and demands substantial insight into your own personality and behavioral patterns, as well as the expectations of the environment. At all times, be interested, helpful, respectful, professional, and present without being obstructive. Even the best students slow down a resident team. Show sensitivity to this and you will stand out by default. Be early and be prepared. Know your patients, their imaging, their numbers, and their plans inside out, and ask if there is any pre-routing you can assist the residents with in the morning. Scrub as many cases as possible, stay late, and offer to take on low-impact scut work where appropriate, like dressing changes or bed checks, et cetera. However, if you are told there is nothing to do or explicitly encouraged to leave the hospital, always do as instructed. Few things annoy residents more than a student who does not listen. So I think that that, that kind of sums up my philosophy things on well, be yourself, don't be a crazy person. Um, and I would also say go out of your way to make sure you meet and make friends with the twos because they are the hardest working people usually in the hospital and seeing what their life is like is gonna teach you what the residency is like and go out of your way to meet the fives, especially if they're off service because they will probably be your chiefs and you wanna get to know them and you wanna show them that you went out of your way to meet them. Like people did that when I was a five, it meant a lot to me. They were like, hey, can we get a cup of coffee so that I can get to meet who my chief might be someday? Um, and also make sure that you obviously, you know, connect with um, the PD and the chair, figure out who you're going to get a letter from. And sometimes you have to talk to the EPC early to make sure that gets on their calendar because a lot of these people are very busy and you want to be respectful of their time. But um, I think that's it. I should uh, turn this over to someone else, but that's my take. Always, always great words, Chris. Thank you. Um, just kind of going through the, the list of people I see here. Uh, Jasmine, I just want to get your thoughts on what Chris said. Any uh, additional words of wisdom that you could toss in there from kind of the senior resident perspective to people looking to start this process? Yeah, I agree with everything that he said. Um, I, I will say that in terms of the uh, the uh, personal statements, I guess, um, I, I think it can be very hard sometimes to stand out in those. So don't fret too much if you don't feel like you're particularly uh, you know, unoriginal in those. I, I don't think it's necessarily a big shot against you. Um, just to sort of echo something um, that Dr. Van Gompel said as well. Um, I think the reason that letters of recommendation are so important in our field is because it is such a small field. A lot of us know each other. And when you see uh, somebody's name on that sheet of paper that you know, uh, whether you're a resident and you rotated at that place and you know that attending really well or it's another attending and they went to residency together or whatever the case may be they're in some professional society um, getting that kind of a a, uh, a letter of recommendation the like stamp of approval basically from one of your friends probably goes you know a long long way this isn't medicine where nobody knows anybody um, we're we all know each other in this field. We're all friends in this field, um, and uh, and we know who we can trust and and whose backgrounds um, we can. Oh, sorry, um, we can uh, can go ahead and, and and take for their words. So um, that's why that's so important. I think there were a couple of questions on here about um, is it important if you know somebody who is important? No, I think as as it's been said, um, it's just important that you get good letters of recommendation. Uh, you just want people who are willing to vouch for you and you as a person, uh, you as a worker, um, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, it was also mentioned the role of residents, and uh, I, I would agree at our institution as well, we have a big um, a rule out role, I guess. Uh, so the residents, you know, you can't pick your family in real life, but you can kind of have some sort of a say in your resident family, um, which is nice. So that's, that's your one chance to pick your brothers and sisters. And uh, I think at a lot of institutions, the residents um, definitely have a say of somebody that doesn't really mesh very well with the program. It's important. There's only you know, anywhere from like 14 to 20 of you guys in a program, maybe 28 of you guys in a program. Um, so you are a very small unit. You're going to be together all the time. Um, you're going to be living in the same room as some of the other ones potentially for, for a period of time. So you need to get along. And I think that's why the that rule out factor is there at a lot of programs. So definitely get to know the residents. It's not just about the chair. It's not just about the program director. Um, and then uh, something else that uh, that Chris brought up that was really uh, a very salient point, I think, was uh, getting involved very early. So it's never too early to get involved in a uh, neurosurgery program. Go to their grand rounds, um, go to their anatomy labs, see if you can just shadow them randomly on wards and as an MS1, as an MS2. Um, familiarity breeds trust, I think. That's just a normal social you know, paradigm. Um, and so the more you're around uh, the, the program, the more they'll recognize you and the more they just innately start trusting you. It's this weird thing that humans do. So um, might as well capitalize on it. 
Um, and then the last thing is uh, just know which years uh, you will be interacting with uh, your chiefs. So I think it sounds like at Chris's program, it's the fives. At our program, it's the threes um, when you're going through the, the sub by process. So just understand sort of what the structure of the program is and make sure that you meet up with those people. I think that's fantastic advice. Can I just comment on one thing that Jasmine said? Um, what about medical students coming in and being involved in the department? It doesn't have to be formal. I think the, one of the problems that happens with the MS ones through threes, and I try to make, I try to break this barrier down, is um, they try to go through your secretary and set up like a whole clinic day, or they try to block a bunch of time. And I say, you know what, just come here for a half an hour. We'll see one patient. I'll teach you one thing that you can go about your day. I don't want to consume all your time get more touch points with that person, you know what they're about. So I think you guys, anybody who's in that role, I think it doesn't have to be big time. It can be little time and meaningful time. I would agree. I would say you can communicate with residents that you may have met at Grand Rounds, you know, go to Grand Rounds occasionally, just spontaneously get to know residents, say, hey, can I round with you on a weekend and cool. shadow you? I mean, very, every, every, little, every little piece of information that's gathered about you over time is very useful. I think Jasmine's very right about that. Familiarity breeds trust. I think that's a great way to put it. Um, very well. Uh, so I want to shift gears a little bit to Joey Lindsay, who's going to introduce her topic um, about how to kind of excel in the interview process. And then we'll kind of wrap, wrap in uh, Dr. Cruz and maybe Dr. Quincy, as well as uh, Dr. Von Gumpel again, and kind of get their thoughts on that, that piece of the puzzle uh, as we go through. So Joey, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that whole process? How can people excel? What are the do's and don'ts, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I think with, with interviews, uh, and this is something that it has been a little different this year with the Zoom interviews, um, but in general, for me as a, as a resident, the, the biggest thing is to be yourself. Um, you know, you occasionally will have people who, who come through and, and you can tell that they're just trying to say the things that they think that you as a neurosurgeon are going to want to hear. Um, and oftentimes that's pretty transparent and ultimately, I think, uh, kind of breeds a lack of trust and just uh, a, a difficulty in connecting with them on a personal level. So I think one of the, the most important things is to, to be yourself. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Quincy mentioned the importance of, of hobbies and your personal, or um, and that kind of like personal aspect of the, um, uh, the application. You can list a few things that, that you like and, um, you know, I think some of the best conversations I've had with uh, interviewees was based on the music that they like or the things that they do outside of the, the hospital. Ultimately, if you have an interview, we already know you have great step scores. You're a smart person. You've probably published. Um, and we've already got a pretty good sense that you're interested in neurosurgery. Um, and those are things that you do have to be able to discuss intelligently, your research and why neurosurgery instead of some other specialty. Uh, but as has been said uh, kind of throughout this, seven years is a really long time. And uh, you know, residency is, there are parts of residency that are quite difficult. And you want to be able to have people that you can lean on uh, and who are human and have that uh, just ability to connect with you and help you. And so I think that being able to show who you are, especially in in-person uh, interviews, being able to, to show you're the type of person who's just going to go out of their way to help. Um, you know, I, almost every uh, interview day, uh, you, you have, you'll have like a lunch, and it's always interesting to see which people leave the lunchroom uh, afterwards uh, kind of quickly and get on to their next activity, and which ones stick around and help make sure that everything's put away, ask, uh, you know, the, the staff who are helping run the day, if there's anything they can do. Um, those kind of small things are noticed, um, always get brought up in these kind of discussions and ultimately uh, can really show people that you're the type of person that they want to work with or they want calling them at three in the morning. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that's that's probably the, the biggest thing, um, being yourself and trying not to kind of pander to uh, what you think a neurosurgeon is going to want to hear. Uh, ultimately, neurosurgeons are people, 
and they have interests outside of the hospital and, and you want to be able to show them that um, that's the type of person you are too. I don't know if there are any other thoughts, but. Yeah, it's perfect. I'm going to um, kind of withhold some of my comments. Aurora, you've been, you've been through this cycle many times. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on what makes people that interview and do sub I stand out versus those that, that, that don't? And, uh, and maybe anything you can think of that's like kind of a, something to stay away from for their interviews. Yeah, certainly. So I, I think that, you know, the old adage, um, the three A's, right, be available, affable, and able. I, I would I would kind of alter it slightly. I, I think for a sub I, it's to be omnipresent, to be cool, and to be prepared. Um, so try to be everywhere, right? Like pop your head into cases, show up in the call room, you know, just it, there's a way to be present in, in the important places as necessary. You're not you're not expected to to be in one single place and wait for someone to tell you what to do next. You know, pop around. Show, hey, you know, there's no cases right now. Can I do you, are you cool if I run to clinic with the boss and, you know, spend a little bit of time in clinic? Um, you know, be cool. I think that um, Joey was just making a great point about that. Like, don't don't be. Um, don't participate in, in, in gossip or any interpersonal issues. It's uh, 80 hours a week in a very high pressured environment. Every single program is going to have drama. I guarantee you. Um, is don't participate in it. Step away. Excuse yourself from the room. Learn how to have a blank face. Um, and then just be prepared, right? Like it, there's a way that you can access the OR schedule. Um, you can look up patients in clinic in advance, kind of know what's going on so that you not necessarily have the right answer, but you have the right questions. Um, Cause I think the questions are just as important if not more important than the, the textbook answer. Um, and I think that as far as interviewing goes, you know, remember you're interviewing the program too, right? So um, there's a lot of shenanigans that can happen during interviews. Um, and you know, you're there to get a, a sense of the place, see if it's a good fit. If they don't seem like they like you, then probably not the best place for you to go, right? Like go somewhere there where they're, they're excited to see you and excited to, to rank you highly and you'll get that sense. Um, and be nice to your co-applicants. Um, I can tell you, it, you know, I, if everyone, single person here has said it, neurosurgery is a small world. I can pick out of a crowd the people I interviewed with and the people who are still my friends and I can tell you stories about the people who, who made an impression, good or bad. So uh, don't be that person, uh, you know, limit yourself to, if, if you are invited to these second look things or this, the, the more in-person interviews, if we get back to that, um, you know, one drink, man, don't, don't, don't buy it. Don't take the bait, okay? They're trying to get you drunk, don't do it. Um, and, you know, just be reasonable, you know, don't, uh, don't make a fool of yourself, be kind to your co-applicants, offer to drive people to the airport, um, I remember one girl in particular, uh, she, she's like, Hey, do you want to share an Uber to the airport? She made me breakfast. Like she brought like, like a little breakfast sandwich all like wrapped up. She's like a friend still because of that. And I think she's an awesome person. So, um, yeah, just be a nice person. Uh, don't, don't, don't mess it up. And and just to give Chris a little bit of like, you know, a solidarity, I love the personal statements. You don't have to have like, you know, grown up in a gutter or, you know, had nurse or, you know, a neurosurgical procedure yourself to be cool. Just understand what you're getting yourself into. Neurosurgery is hard for very specific reasons, right? Like our patients are extraordinarily critical. You will be the person who tells people the worst news of their life. Um, the expectations are higher, I think, than almost any other specialty. Um, the work hours stink, um, but, you know, if you have a passion for it and you can express that you understand these things and that you still love it, I think that that that's an impressive personal statement to me. If you can in, you can somehow get that across that you get it and you love it and you're going to do it no matter what, that's perfect. That's my favorite. So anyway, I still like the personal statements. I hope we keep those. That's, that's kind of all. That's good. Um, I wanted to, sorry, my dog's barking in the background. Uh, Carol, <laughs> any thoughts? Uh, you've, you've had a little time to hear all this and then we're going to, I want to get the medical students input as well. Any more thoughts uh, based on the conversations that we've had? Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. I think these are all really great points. Um, I read the personal statements just to find uh, red flags, not to include people. So I find it to be an exclusion. So um, if you tell me that your dad and grandpa and everybody has been a nurse in the past, like that's usually perceived kind of negatively. I think if you um, talk about, um, uh, you know, that um, you drilled a burr hole and it inspired you to be a neurosurgeon, you know, that's like a really 
that a lot of us had an experience which drilled the hole and it was great. Um, but you know, we're talking about really highly complex surgery. And so that's maybe not something to base, like something you want to do your whole career. And then a lot of people have this thing about writing about the pulsating brain. So, um, that it really irritates people. So I think there's certain things that turn people off that, um, that I think you want to be leery of and, and just know that some people will read it and some people won't read your personal statement. The other thing I'll say about interviews in particular is that, um, going to somebody you trust and saying, Hey, can you point out my, um, my uh, just sort of blind spots and can you give me feedback? Like, how is this perceived if I said this? And somebody doesn't give you like actual critical feedback. It's so valuable to hear how that's perceived on the other, on the, um, other side. And then um, I think, you know, when, when you're interviewing, you want to really think about the goals of it. I think as an applicant, you think that the more you talk and the more that they hear about yourself, the, the better the interview is going. And that is really not at all a good interview. So if the other person, the person interviewing you is talking more than half the time, that is a great interview. If they related to you, they thought you were a great person. You had a great conversation. When you leave the room, they're going to be like, I just like liked that person. And I see myself in them and I want to train them and this would be a great experience. That's the, that's what you want. So you're not going to sit down and be asked a bunch of questions. It, the reality is, is that you're gonna be asked a couple of questions and then it's gonna be a conversation. So if you're not ready to generate and participate in that conversation, it's going to be a really painful interview and you're going to walk out and they're not going to feel something about how that went. These are really amazing comments. I, I, I don't have that much to add. The only thing I would add uh, before we get, to, I want to get the medical students thoughts on these things. Um, is that it, for me is like things not to do are the most important. And, and one is you absolutely have to be honest at all times. Um, if you don't know someone's temperature or culture results or whatever, just say, I'm not sure I'll find out as soon as I can. Um, I mean, that's a simple example, but just in general, if people start to get the sense that you're not reliable, they're going to really hesitate to match you because they don't want, um, you know, patients are the number one thing that we care for. And we're, we're hesitant to trust, to match people that we don't trust with patient care. Um, the second thing is whatever many people have said, which is that be affable, don't, and, and, or don't be malignant. Um, that's, that's a big red flag too. Everybody has had someone in their program who's disgruntled or just generally very negative, And it's not, sometimes not the best experience to work with these people. So, um, you know, I think be, always act like you love neurosurgery, not that you hate your life uh, and that will get you far. So um, those are my, those are my, my thoughts uh, on this. So uh, I want to go to our most senior medical student, Saqib. Are you still here? I'm looking for you on my list here. Um, so Saqib just went through the process and matched, congratulations. I want to hear sort of like your debriefing of uh, having gone through this just recently and anything that we're missed or that you would put in from the medical student's perspective that people should know. Definitely. Yeah, I, I wanted to briefly highlight uh, Dr. Van Gompel's earlier point about entropy. I think that was a really valuable point. I think uh, one of my biggest takeaways from doing this virtually, this most recent cycle, was just the importance of being proactive. I think both in learning about programs and also in demonstrating your interest uh, in different programs. And there were several things I was advised to do um, that I found helpful that I just want to briefly um, pass on. The first was uh, talk to residents at your home institution. I know we mentioned this earlier. They're a great resource. You know, ask them about their experiences, sub eyeing different places, interviewing different places that you might not get to see in person. That's a really helpful uh, sort of insider's perspective. Uh, second, feel free to reach out to recently matched applicants. I think I, th I speak for everyone in saying, you know, we would be very happy to talk about experiences kind of doing this uh, virtually from the applicant perspective. Uh, a third thing is, if there is any virtual programming going on this year, like uh, virtual meet and greets or information sessions with different programs, um, whenever you can, you know, show up to those, participate, turn your camera on, you know, try to sort of get a vibe for the place, um, you know, pay attention to how residents interact with each other, even if it's over Zoom, and just see if you think you might fit in with that. Uh, and I would, I would give a brief shout out to uh, Jazz, who is a real champion for that, uh, for the applicants this past cycle and, and sort of organizing some of those things. Um, fourth thing is, uh, I think it's appropriate. Now, I, I would defer to our panel here, but I think it's appropriate to reach out to programs directly. Uh, you know, last cycle, I, I know there was a lot of communication that happened between applicants' programs before interviews and after interviews. Um, you know, talking with the residents, asking about their experiences, ask, you know, demonstrating your interest, and you know, just understanding what it's like to be a resident at that program. I mean, I, I personally found that very helpful, and found that residents were happy to talk, were very forthcoming about their opinions. 
Uh, and the last thing would just be to reach out to other applicants, you know, doing it, uh, doing this virtually, we didn't have quite the same in-person trail experience, but you still saw a lot of the same faces. And I know, especially as the cycle went on, started to have a lot of kind of offline conversations with other applicants, just trying to get to know each other. These are, you know, people who I, I realize a small world will go on to become lifelong friends. And uh, we sort of shared a lot of information along the way as well about experiences we had uh, at, at different programs, rotating different places and whatnot. I thought that was really valuable. Excellent. Um, Sammy, you haven't done this yet. Uh, any questions you have or that you've seen from our chat that you think are, are particularly important that you want to know before you embark on this here shortly? Well, I'm excited first to get started in the process. I know I have a little bit of time left, but I think, at least for me, trying to get a better understanding of what questions are considered unique in the interview process to ask. I guess then my question would be, what is the question that stands out to you that an uh, interviewee has asked along the interview trail? I think we can ask uh, Dr. Dr. Van, Gumpel, Van Gumpel and uh, and then Dr. Quincy about this question. I, I think I'll project what Dr. Quincy was saying is that um, she, everybody seems to have their three questions they came in with and they ask them to the seven people that they're gonna meet. And I think what she was saying, and I agree with her completely, I think it's a really smart point is that, um, you know, if you're sitting down with me, you might want to ask how the skull base program interacts with the, with the, you know, the fellowship interacts with the residency. They want to see that you've done your homework ahead of time. You know, the one, the, the comment that was constantly asked last year is what's your teaching style? I don't know where that came from, but uh, that was a weird question. And a lot of the staff across the country have been kind of making fun of that because uh, I would say that, uh, it was weird because, um, you know, it is, it is what it is. I know that people can't see, can't see them, but it doesn't really, I don't think they're going to remember that. Um, but I think things that, that um, will make you stick out in their mind, and, and it was Dr. Quincy, I think, that said it, that, um, you know, generating that conversation, you want your questions to trigger, you know, positive thoughts in that person's head. So think about how you can trigger somebody, and I think that will be your questions that are unique. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, I think that the more your questions are, the more the conversation falls, falls flat. And your questions, you might think that they're unique, but they're the same questions that everybody has if, if they're the same that you ask everybody. And so, um, you know, just just was, as he just said, I think that like, if, if, uh, I, if you're interviewing with me, the questions should be specific to the things that I'm involved in. And so sometimes I'm, I'm across somebody in an interview, and in, when we're doing in-person interviews, there's nothing in my office that will tell you that I'm a pediatric and skull-based neurosurgeon who does global neurosurgery. And so I can tell they didn't do their homework because all of their questions have nothing to do with anything that I do. And they could ask the same questions of any of the faculty. And the people who have looked me up, they have any clue, even like a superficial clue about what it is that I'm doing that, and they generate some sort of conversation, then they, uh, they walk away and I feel like we had a meaningful conversation. So it does take some homework in the virtual environment there's a huge added that you get to have notes pretty close by because it's a lot to sort of you know keep keep all together but um i think that your questions should be genuine and that they should be very specific to the person that you're talking to and i learned something about dr quincy tonight is that if i was interviewing with her i would look into hobbies and i would have my hobbies questions ready for her yeah, dr quincy is going to have to deal with hobbies questions from now going forward. <laughs> very good, very good. Thank you. This, I think this is great advice, great advice. I, I did want to bring in on one extra um, um, point to get everyone's thoughts on, which is, uh, you know, especially now that it's somewhat up in the air, how many we're going to do, but um, Chris and I have had this discussion before, I think maybe on a podcast along with Joey. Um, what is the strategy people should have for um, scheduling their away rotations, assuming they just have one this year? Um, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but I think it's a really important point for people that are really actively thinking about how to do that process now. Um, you know, in the past, you had three or four, you know, maybe you could get a place you really wanted to match and then a place that, that's geographically diverse, geographically diverse, uh, and then maybe like a, you know, you know, dream program or something like that. How would you go about telling people to plan their sub eyes this year? Dr. Van Gogh. 
Oh, <laughs> I mean, I would, I, you know, with one away rotation, if it's not your home rotation, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that it's the place you want to go. If you can circle one program, that's the place. And, and as Chris said, I like how Chris said it is um, you got to put up or shut up sometimes. And uh, you get into, you know, if you're scared, you're going to underperform. That's okay. Um, this, I, I think people get too caught up in that, as he said, but I go there. And then I think in, in absence of, if, if there are five across the board that you're going to like to go, um, that you're interested in, I'd pick the thing that you think you're going to match best with or closest to home, because ultimately seven years is a long time. And we find that people do tend to gravitate back towards home, if they, especially if they've traveled away for a while, because they know they're going to start having children or families and, and things like that. So those are really, I think, things to think about. Excellent. Um, I wanted to bring Anna, where is Anna? Uh, and is there any questions that you thought, I mean, many of them have been answered. Thank you to all the panelists who've been answering questions. There are a lot of questions. Any of these that you think uh, you would want to know of the questions in the, in the I box? I think there is one that I, I will personally would like to know um, because I, I will be an, an IMG in the future. So how do you find a mentor who can vouch for yourself, for, who can vouch successfully for you, especially as an IMB, or maybe just find a mentor at like a normal US um, medical student. How can you find mentorship in neurosurgery? Maybe Van Gumpel and then Quincy and then anyone else that has thoughts. Yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough one. Um, there are some amazing IMG applicants and I field this question from probably 20 or 30 a year, and we have an international fellowship. So there's things like an international fellowship in our program that if you're post-residency, you can get into. There are some new programs like University of Minnesota. I know uh, there's a program in Florida that's starting these one-year like um, rotations that are clinical. The problem is we don't know where you're, where you're coming from, how good you know your teaching is. We're not familiar enough with it. So it doesn't give you broad abilities to match at programs. And also there's always this unknown thing about what type of visa you're gonna be eligible for. So it scares a lot of programs. Um, what is working in your favor right now is there's a lot of EMGs that are matching because of this ill-perceived or, or I don't know if, how people think about this, but the millennials don't work is what keeps being said and people are going more towards IMG. So there's a higher number matching recently. But you do have to find someone that you're going to work with that's going to vouch for you. But I think you have to do that at more than one institution commonly. It's uh, So you have to plan for a couple of years, actually, sometimes doing research or clinical rotations. But that's what you have to do. It's a tough road. So good luck, please. I'll speak more generally about just finding a mentor. I think that the first person I met with in neurosurgery um, I could tell wasn't going to be an advocate for me and, um, you know, was the most prestigious person in that department, but just wasn't going to be somebody I clicked with or, or whatnot. And so you just meet with somebody else and eventually you find the person that you click with, you think that they're going to invest in, in you and you think that you're going to get along well, and, and it doesn't have to be the most prestigious person at the institution. And it might be, uh, you know, a resident who's going to be uh, more of your champion along with having some other relationships. And um, so I think, I think that you want to try on a couple of different people and, and see where you're going to click and find somebody that you think is really going to be a champion for you. Carolyn, how would you recommend a student engage a mentor? Um, ask them if you would be my mentor or offer to, you know, shadow them. Plus, do you have any papers laying around, case reports I could write? How, what is the best way to kind of start that relationship, mentorship relationship? Yeah, I think I think asking um, to be mentored is like a really awkward question. I think that real mentorship comes comes naturally. And so generally what happens, somebody reaches out to me and I'm sure to a lot of you and they say, um, can I just talk to you? I'm, I'm interested in what you do and, and you have a conversation. And then in that conversation, they say, I would really love to be involved specifically in these things. You have opportunities. And then, and then usually an attending will float out an opportunity to see how you respond to it. And what you wanna do is you wanna grab it. You wanna do as much as you can independently, reasonably, and then come back with, with questions and, and show that you can execute something, that you come back with reasonable questions and, um, and that you can uh, you know, be a, a great person to work with and to be mentored. And then, and then you get another thing. And that's, that's how mentorship really comes about is that you have one engagement and it leads to other engagements. And then you know that that person's gonna be a champion for you because they constantly 
know that you're going to be a positive person in, in, in working with them. And that's great advice. Uh, one thing I would point out, given the IMG um, question uh, from Anna and, uh, and some folks in the audience, is that we actually did a podcast. So one of the sister projects for this webinar is a podcast with the medical student um, training group. Um, we can send a link to it. Uh, it's called the Nurse Surgeon's Journey. And one of the one of the podcasts was specifically on this question about I am you know, matching nurse surgery as an international medical graduate. Had a very very good discussion uh, and, and comprehensive discussion with a few IMGs that have done it about the various pathways to it and the limitations uh, of the timing when you have to graduate from medical school and then and then have to have some credentialing done before you can even apply here, etc. So I, I would encourage for the um. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue, but uh, what I was just gonna say is I was gonna add to the question about the research thing and the mentorship thing. A really great thing to ask residents in particular is, do you have anything you're working on that I can help you get it over the finish line? Because a lot of people take on projects and they don't realize how much chart review they have to do or um, they you know, get really busy clinically, they're on one rotation and end up on another one. And you know, that's kind of your signaling, like I wanna pitch in, I wanna work hard, I don't expect to be first author on something. You can show someone your work ethic and that you're interested and build a little report. And then from there, you know, take something on your own. Like that's a, if you're having a hard time really getting um, ownership of a project from the get-go, just offering to help and being willing to contribute goes a long way towards signaling that you're a team player. Hey Chris, what would you say about taking on a project and not completing it though? So these are these are bombs, right? So if you take on a project, make sure you complete if you're you're committed to completing it. Yeah, absolutely. Smart, you know, don't be beyond your abilities, like uh, you know, and and try to do something quickly, like a case report. You should be able to get that done in less than a month, ideally a week or two. Yeah, exactly. I mean. You look good if you if you hit it out of the park and do it fast and well, and if you don't complete it, it's, it's the opposite. I agree. Um, all right. Uh, let's see here, uh, Aurora. Any other thoughts or questions or can or things you want to add? I think we've kind of run through the majority of these questions. If not, we can ask Anna for another one. But there were a lot of really great questions in the question and answer that uh, were answered beautifully um, uh, by a number of you. So thank you. No, I mean, I think that, you know, we're all kind of saying the same thing here, which is, you know, if you love neurosurgery and you behave proper, you know, you show up and you do a good job and, you know, anything is a double-edged sword, right? Your sub-eyes are a double-edged sword, your projects are a double-edged sword, um, but but this, it does not get any easier or any more straightforward uh, as you move through this process. Every every obligation you take on as a resident or as a faculty member will uh, will, will reflect upon you. So, you know, I, I, what I'll say is that um, if you choose to do something and you're good at it, you'll get more of it. So if you really, really hate uh, a certain type of research, don't maybe just like kind of don't invest yourself in those kinds of projects and kind of, you know, shy away from the faculty who are kind of trying to get the med students to participate in that and, and really like focus your efforts on people who are doing stuff that you're passionate about because it's just a lot easier to do things that you love. And if you're good at things that you love, you'll get more of it. Um, but, you know, I think that, uh, you know, again, I just come back to being omnipresent, you know, just, just show up, man, come to, come to Grand Rounds, you know, show up in clinic randomly, you know, you don't have to ask permission, don't wait for somebody to call you or to tell you what to do, just kind of, you know, don't be annoying, but like, just, just kind of show up and be like, hey, you know, I, I, I saw you were, you had three, you know, uh, trigeminal neuralgia patients on your, on your schedule today, I'd really love to learn more about that, you know you know, it, that, that kind of genuine enthusiasm will, will really go a long ways. Um, I, I think there was one, Vikram had a question about uh, transitioning into third year with no home programs. Um, I think that's a really tough situation for a lot of people, but I, I think it's actually fairly common. And I think in, in a way, the current situation that we're in right now with COVID makes uh, that a little bit easier in a way, because um, the, the the interactions, the social interactions uh, that you have with with programs are a little bit uh, diminished regardless of whether you have a home program or not. So again, you know, you just kind of have to, to pick something geographically close um, 
you know, find somebody who can mentor you and, and be omnipresent there just because it's not, they're not involved in your institution specifically, doesn't mean they don't have connections. They went to residency somewhere. Um, and, and those are the kinds of things. Neurosurgery is a chain of, you know, degrees of, of, of people knowing each other. You know, I can say that I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grandchild of John Jane senior because I'm being trained by someone who trained you know, who was trained by him, right? I and mean, we can all talk about our genealogy in some way. Um, so, you know, just getting involved with neurosurgeons um, and, and even if it's not uh, a prestigious institution, we'll, we'll get you the connections you need. Great. Um, okay, I think we're, we're, we've done an amazing job of covering this topic. I just wanna, if there's anyone else any final thoughts or concerns or questions or tidbits they wanted to toss in, I, I think we've really, um, done a great job of wrapping our arms around this one. Um, Saqib, any last thoughts? You, you just finished. I, I, I think you're the one with the most glowing recollection of this process in your mind. I, I would defer to what the, the panel has said so far. I think this was a lot of great advice that definitely I found to be true uh, doing it this past year and try to enjoy the process too. I know there's a lot of stress that goes into it, but it's a blast. I mean, I had a lot of fun uh, even though I was doing this, you know, through my uh, my computer camera, it was still a lot of fun. It still felt real, uh, and had some great conversations, relationships built, and whatnot. So, uh, definitely something to look forward to. Um, if I may, there was one question in the Q and A that I thought could be helpful. Um, Dr. Quincy, I saw you gave a great answer that might just be useful for everyone to hear. Um, are there any thoughts on applying to multiple ways, but having to withdraw once you get one acceptance? Just wondering if it might reflect poorly on programs that you applied to, but then eventually have to withdraw from. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, my my medical students applying this year were talking to me about this today. They're really worried about the awkwardness of this. And the reality is, is that you will apply to multiple places and that this happens every year. And it's a sort of heightened this year that you can only accept one one away rotation. And so everyone knows that this is the case. And um, it's it you will be considered at that institution very likely without it without it being an exclusion to you. I think it becomes awkward that you know if a student comes to me and asks me to reach out to a program on their behalf, and then they 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 don't accept that um, that program, then then that might be a situation in which you were highlighted, and and now your rejection of that rotation is highlighted. So um, I think that yeah, it's it's always been a reality. It's like maybe heightened in this season that you're going to have to only you're you can only take one place, and um, I don't think that it will exclude you from doing rotations. Same thing when you're applying to programs. Um, and you know you've done your way rotations. You're applying to programs. You will turn down interview offers, and you might then be applying for a fellowship later on. And um, we all know that you, there's only so many um, uh, rotations you can do. There's only so many places you can go to interview, and um, and it's just a reality of the system. And so it doesn't exclude you from things. But thanks for bringing that up. I think it's a common anxiety that people have. I agree. Uh, any closing thoughts, Dr. Van Gumpel, or? Oh, this was awesome. This I appreciate was, uh, you coming, a lot of yeah. fun. I really appreciate you guys giving me something I can actually talk intelligently about. <laughs> You're being very modest. You're extremely accomplished. And we all we all know that. Um, I would like to point out a few resources for the students who uh, who may be new to thinking about neurosurgery. There is uh, a neurosurgery um, Young Neurosurgeons InRef webinar. So this webinar series has a playlist on the InRef YouTube page, easy to Google Young Neurosurgeons InRef uh, webinar. Um, there's a series of medical student related webinars uh, that are posted there. Um, and so please check that out. Also, we mentioned the, the um, podcast, which has a lot of these same issues covered. They kind of kind of go hand in hand a little bit more detail. Often in the podcast, things are covered. Um, also, uh, Dr. Angapo and I and the crew were talking about there, there may be um, some new uh, information about how the match is going to look this year uh, coming up in the next few months. So we'll try our best to keep people abreast on those changes uh, for those of you who are interviewing this year. Um, and with that, unless anyone has any other uh, comments, I'll go to my closure slides because there's a few, there's a few surveys I need to make sure I highlight for uh, some of our, some of our uh, leadership. So here we go. You know, I don't wanna be uh, remiss uh, in thanking uh, Anna for all of her hard work that she does to help put this together. 
Um, and also uh, Becky Sturr, who is with the NREF, who also does a tremendous amount of the background work to make these webinars happen. So thank you both for your hard work and dedication. Um, again, I just wanna say there is gonna be a webinar next week, um, which you can see here and the link I believe was put in the chat. Um, if you wanna register for this and some of the questions were related to this topic. So I'm sure we're getting to those. Here's just a little uh, overview of what the of the uh, Nurse Surgeon's Journey podcast, which has, I believe, uh, 14 episodes now up, many of them related to interviewing and, and medical student issues. Um, the, the surveys, so the Society of Neurological Surgeons, if you or most likely people you know who have just matched, um, please look in your mail, email box. Both young nurse surgeons as well as, this, as the Society of Neurological Surgeons have um, a, a survey that we want to understand how this virtual match year went and things that um, so we can understand how people felt it went and how we may be able to help um, in moving forward. Also, if any of you are in the Young Nurse Surgeons group, there should be also be a Young Nurse Surgeons survey in your email box. Um, I didn't put this link in the uh, chat, but maybe before we close, we can toss it in there. Um, but please take these two surveys. Finally, we have a Young Nurse Surgeons NREF fund uh, for one of the people who has mentored many of us, uh, the WNS staff member, Chris Phillips, um, and the uh, money will ultimately be used to help mentor medical students, particularly from places that don't have um, strong home programs and, and this type of thing. So if anybody you know wants to give a donation to medical student mentorship, please check that out. It's easily found on NREF's YouTube, NREF's page. This is the, what we were mentioning earlier, the NREF webinar series playlist. Um, so you can check that out. We also often post about last week's webinar when it's posted um, on our Twitter and Instagram. And um, so follow us on social media. And from there, I just wanna thank everybody who joined us, um, both as the audience members and um, the panel. This has been a really out outstanding discussion, I think, and hopefully will help a lot of um, people going through the match this year, uh, particularly given all the uh, fluctuations in this, how, how it's been carried out. And hopefully we can keep you all up to date on how uh, things are evolving as we move forward, particularly follow us on um, our social media and keep in touch with us regarding the, the, um, the webinars for that, for that material. So thank you all for coming, our amazing panelists and, and our guest, Dr. Van Guppel. Thank you for coming and I appreciate it. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.